Oh my days. <laughs> so, firstly, I'll begin by saying sorry I'm late. If the will of the NUJ Black Members Council would have been respected, I would have given the Claudia Jane's Memorial Lecture for Black History Month on October the 11th. But as we all know, there was a concerted effort led by mostly white columnists at the Guardian Observer to stop that happening. <laughs> but thanks to the unwavering solidarity of new media, freelance journalists, the Black Members Council, and all of you, those efforts were for naught. All they achieved was to prove themselves unworthy hosts of an event to honour Claudia Jones. Because if they can't handle me, they would have run screaming from her. <laughs> and so, it is my honour to welcome you all to the inaugural alternative <laughs> Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture. Tonight, we reclaim Claudia Jones. She was a radical, an activist, and a proper lefty. She was, <laughs> she, she was one of us, and a bunch of entitled pundits do not get to hijack her memory in service of tokenism. In the truest spirit of this phenomenal woman, we're getting on and making change happen ourselves. Thank you to Sam and Sophia for sharing their wonderful words with us tonight, and to Team Canary and Sans Film Studios for moving heaven and earth to create this event in just a handful of days. I'm going to throw these as I go, but I will pick them up at the end, so <laughs> there's, there's no littering. So, who was Claudia? This is her. Claudia Jones was born Claudia Vera Cumberbatch in Trinidad in 1915, as the First World War raged across Europe and the Commonwealth. She described her later name change to Claudia Jones as, quote, self-protective disinformation. <laughs> I, lo I love her. <laughs> When she was nine years old, her family emigrated to the United States to escape the post-war cocoa crash that crushed the Trinidadian economy. But in reality, things weren't much better for a poor black family in 1920s New York. Within five years, her mother had died. She literally collapsed over a sewing machine at her factory job, worked to death. And in 1932, Wretched living conditions nearly, nearly killed Claudia too. She contracted tuberculosis, and although she survived, the irreparable damage to her lungs plagued her throughout her devastatingly short life. Despite receiving the Theodore Roosevelt Award for Good Citizenship in junior high and showing outstanding academic promise, Claudia's gender, class, and color saw her barred from pursuing a college education. Racial, economic, and gender inequality came together in what she would later describe as triple oppression to obstruct her path. So she began working in a laundry in Harlem, and on the side, she began writing a column called Claudia's Comments for the Harlem Journal. If there was a single event that radicalized Claudia, it was the case of the Scottsboro Boys, Nine black boys, one as young as 13 years old, were falsely accused of raping two white women and sentenced to death by an all-white jury. Claudia wanted to help, and her search for organisations that were supporting the boys led her to join the Young Communist League. Through her roles with the Communist Party of the United States, she began fulfilling her potential as an activist and a journalist. Before long, <coughs> she was a prominent leader in the movement, a woman both feared and respected for her passion, intellect, and drive for equality. In her own words, Claudia called for people to come together as an anti-imperialist coalition managed by working class leadership, fueled by the involvement of women. 
by the mid-1940s, Claudia addressed crowds of 14,000 people at New York's Madison Square Garden. Eyewitnesses recall she held the crowd in such raptured silence, you could have heard a pin drop anywhere in the stadium. And this was before the civil rights movement, before Rosa Parks, before Martin Luther King. And yet Claudia Jones, this working class black woman who wasn't permitted to drink from the same water fountains as white people, was captivating crowds at one of the most prestigious venues in the entire country. She was seen as more radical than Karl Marx <laughs> because she knew that capitalism was just one source of oppression. We could deal with capitalism tomorrow and racism and sexism and other structural oppression would remain. This meant Claudia was not only challenging the capitalist establishment, but the communist establishment too. She was fighting for equality for all. She believed that fight belonged to everyone, and so everyone belonged in the fight. And this, for me, is the crucial gulf between white middle-class liberalism and the radical left-wing movements that grow up in working class and non-white communities. White middle-class liberalism says, be patient, We'll gift you some more rights as soon as we can. You just sit politely over there while we try and sort this all out for you. The left, the radicals, and the activist movement say, we will build an equal future together. Radical movements are urgent and inclusive because as Claudia knew all too well, if the leadership and membership of any movement excludes the very people it claims to support, it has already failed. Her thinking on this was remarkably prescient because it could be written on the tombstone of neoliberalism today. And everyone on the left must have this front and center in our minds if we do not want to repeat the mistakes of our history. If our solidarity doesn't extend past the borders of our own self-interest, it's no kind of solidarity at all. Between 1948 and 1945, Claudia Jones was jailed four times for her activism. She was criminalized for campaigning for equality in housing, education, and employment. She was 36 and serving one of these sentences when she had her first heart attack. The same year, she and 11 others were convicted of un-American activities, whatever that means, under anti-communist legislation of the era. And by 1955, the US began moves to deport her. But she was refused entry to her birth home of Trinidad. Why? because the British governor general of the day didn't want to let her in. He said, quote, she may prove troublesome. <laughs> Claudia, I can identify. <laughs> in December 1955, just six days after Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama, Claudia Jones was deported. But the US and colonial Trinidad's loss was our gain because this brought Claudia Jones to Britain. Despite ailing health, she created a legacy here that has long survived her. She founded and edited the West Indian Gazette and co-founded the Notting Hill Carnival. And both these projects were about putting black culture front and center in Britain. Claudia wanted to show the country and show the world that black people were equal in every way, including their own thriving arts and culture. At a time when signs reading no Irish, no blacks, no dogs were commonplace here, Claudia campaigned relentlessly for equality. 
But on Christmas Eve 1964, Claudia suffered a massive heart attack and died. She was only 49. Her funeral was a major public event and she was buried most appropriately to the left of Karl Marx. <laughs> That's true, you can actually see their tombstones next to each other in Highgate Ceremony uh, Cemetery. And while it's really tempting to say that the world was left a lesser place without her, that would really sell short her legacy. Claudia did not come to knock politely at the door of the British establishment. She came to kick it down. To the establishment of her day, she was the wrong colour, the wrong gender, and she had the wrong politics. But rather than conform and beg permission to enter that network of privilege, Claudia sought to dismantle it altogether. Her mission was to build a world that works for everyone. Claudia often said that people without a voice were as lambs to the slaughter. This is what drove her to create new media platforms to give voice to the new ideas and the new ways of doing things that could make that world possible. And a few decades later, that is exactly the sentiment that drove me into activism and journalism. I thank Claudia Jones for making it possible for me and countless women like me to plough our own furrow. And it is in her memory and in her spirit that I present this lecture tonight. So now I want to talk to you about how we build a world that works for everyone and how a new media is essential to that mission. Okay, <coughs> could you all just take your mobile phones out of your pockets? Every one of you, have a dig. Fabulous, well done. And now wave them in the air like a lighter at a rock concert. Excellent. That is actually entirely irrelevant to this analogy, but I just really... <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun for me. <laughs> now, if I told you that that phone of yours was it for phones, that it was impossible for humankind to do better than that phone, you'd probably call me crazy. Why? Because you believe in the power of technological revolutions, past and future, to improve your phone. We're like that with science and technology. We eagerly anticipate revolutionary change because of the anticipated benefits of technological progress. But when it comes to socioeconomic matters, our politics, our economics, we are conditioned largely by our media to be Philistines, afraid of and resigned about the possibility of rapid and dramatic change for the better. Those pushing the boundaries of science and technology are celebrated as pioneers. Those pushing the boundaries of social and political change are dismissed as dreamers, or worse, vilified as extremists. That stark difference places limits on our ability to create revolutionary human progress. It tells us that it is impossible to build a world that works for everyone. And these limiting thoughts are shackles that we have to break. <coughs> there he is. Martin Luther King never said, I have a time-boxed, achievable five-point plan. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. He placed himself in an imaginary future and shared what he saw so vividly that it was real to the people of 1963. The task of building a world that works for everyone demands that we have the audacity to dream that big and the sheer bloody mindedness to settle for nothing less. Stories are everything. Your story about yourself, what you are capable of, who you are, what you can stand, it will define you. 
if we listen to those gossips, bullies, even the voices in our own head who try to make us small, we end up shrinking. Our view of ourselves and what's possible in our lives gets limited by those stories. Well, the same is true of the world. The role of the media in shaping our view of ourselves, each other, our world, and what's possible within it is enormous. And it's got us into some real trouble now. The first time I learned that there was something very wrong with the political and media storytellers of our country came in 2002. During my first and only year <laughs> at Sussex University, I went to a talk about Israel and Palestine. A group of students had been and were sharing videos and stories from their trip. And what I saw blew my mind. And a few weeks later, I was on the next delegation to Palestine to witness the reality of life under Israeli occupation. I saw Janine bulldozed to dust. Nablus in tatters. Ramallah defiant despite occupation. I saw Palestine, a place I'd been led to believe was a sand pit full of savages and found a thriving and vibrant culture. Theatres, cinemas, universities, human beings that had dreams not unlike my own. And I felt conned. On our last night in Ramallah, Israel invaded. We went from bearing witness to the aftermath of an Israeli invasion to being caught up in a new one. And that's how I spent my 21st birthday as a human shield, occupying a key building in Ramallah in the hopes that Israel wouldn't bomb it with Brits inside. That's literally the building I was in. F-16 fighter jets roared over our heads. Apache helicopters thundered past the building, shaking windows out of their frames. Tanks tore up the concrete street, shaking the building to its foundations. Everywhere was the sound of exploding cars and homes. It was nighttime, but the sky was lit up in a sort of red Martian daylight with the fires and munitions that were engulfing the town. We went to a TV in the building, convinced that this must be on the news. We scrolled through the news channels, finding nothing. And then we came to BBC News 24, where a correspondent in Jerusalem said, and I quote, it's a quiet night in Ramallah. Israeli forces have withdrawn to the gates of the city. Meanwhile, we were in Ramallah, in the middle of all hell breaking loose. And I realized that even if I had cared enough to tune into the BBC that night to find out what was happening, not only would I have been uninformed, I would have been misinformed. I would have been relieved. I would have been telling other people the good news, unwittingly parroting fake news. The reality of this and everything I saw in Palestine broke me. I came home filled with the kind of anger that consumes you. I dropped out of university and spent a couple of years working a string of temp jobs in fields, factories and care homes. My story about myself was that it was over for me and building a world that works for everyone. It was too big a dream for me. In time, thanks to my family and some extraordinary friends, I threw myself into creating a new life. I built a successful career as a project manager in banking, the NHS and local government, working on multi-million and multi-billion pound projects. I met and married the woman of my dreams. I was happy and living the kind of life I never thought I would when I was in the wilderness years. But if I'm completely honest, I knew I wasn't doing what I was here to do. I wasn't building a world that works for everyone. Then the Occupy movement happened. And my wife reminded me that I was a person who was here to change the world. 
So I wound up my management consultancy business to go and live in a tent in Finsbury Square <laughs> with other people who wanted to build a world that works for everyone. And if anyone ever asks you, what did the Occupy movement ever achieve? It made millions of people like me re-engage with the dream of building a world that works for everyone. Everywhere you look now, in campaigns, education, new media, you see former occupiers. While I was there, I started writing my blog called Scriptonite Daily. Each day I wrote a story about an issue or event which I felt needed to be retold. And over the next few years, it became one of the best known independent political blogs in the country. If we're going to build a wor world that works for everyone, we have to start by getting real about what's actually happening in the world as it is. So my role, my fight, would be helping to create a new media. We have a media in Britain which is almost entirely owned by three corporations. Three. The journalists who staff them are mostly white, mostly male, and mostly middle class. They attended the same handful of universities and graduated a few inches to the left or right of each other politically. This gap between them forms the minuscule arena in which all of our media debate happens. On politics, on economics, on foreign policy, on the kind of society we can and want to build together. It is a lid on our ability to dream together and a barrier to telling the huge array of stories that this tiny slice of humanity neither understands nor values. Worse, their stories about us, each other, and our ability to change the world keep us small, passive, and disempowered. So in the spirit of Claudia Jones, a new media revolution is happening. Instead of begging the old media to give us a platform, we are building our own. And that's what Script Tonight Daily was for me. Then, 12 years after my first trip to Palestine, Israel launched a devastating 52-day assault on Gaza in the summer of 2014. <coughs> I never let go of Palestine. I'd continued to visit my friends there ever since and deepen my knowledge of the history and the reality of life under Israeli occupation. And in 2014, I sat watching the news, feeling the anger rise at how far away it was from the truth. And it dawned on me, this time, I could do something about it. I might not be able to stop Israel illegally occupying Palestine, but I could report the reality of the occupation. So I set up a crowdfunding campaign inviting the readers of my blog to fund me to be their reporter on the ground in Gaza. And in less than a week, they'd done it. A few weeks later, I was in Gaza, witnessing a fresh kind of hell being meted out to its 1.8 million civilian residents. Every day, I published details accounts of what I saw, and every night, I did a live video report with a question and answer session. And I made a documentary film, which I screened at venues across the country when I came home. And we're going to show you the trailer for that film now. This is a mosque that's been bombed overnight in the heart of Gaza City. People are still praying. You've got to ask who they're praying to. And it doesn't sound like anybody's listening right now. It's about justice. The whole thing is about justice. The children wanted to go to sleep in the night. Every time he, he tried to sleep, they make a big bomb. They came up, very afraid and crying. What can we do for the children? A simple conflict. Did you ever hear about the French-Algerian conflict? There was no French-Algerian conflict. There was a French occupation in Algeria. 
and it was ended. And same, same here. There is not exactly Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There is first of all an Israeli occupation which must come to its end. I got this with his house. Yeah. It's not house now. So the very infrastructure of the state is that of supremacy, uh, discrimination, ethnic-based discrimination by law and in practice. Eight months pregnant, and this is for home. This is where they live. This woman and her seven children. The two-state solution is yesterday's solution. We missed the chance for this. It's only to gain time. It's an excuse to gain time. Two-state, two-state. It's it's over. This is an excerpt from one. Thank you. This is an excerpt from one of my daily reports. It describes what I found talking to patients along just one corridor of Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. A man sits in a wheelchair. His left leg was blown off while he sat on his own doorstep. Israel had announced a four-hour ceasefire, so he was about to go to find food and supplies during the break from shelling. Instead, an Israeli shell landed in the street, killing 12 and injuring 120 of the residents. His lifelong best friend was killed. He tells me he does not even know how to live in the world without him. A child, just eight years old, lays on a gurney his pelvis and femur were shattered when he was blown from his fourth story home by an F-16 missile, which killed many of his relatives. A plaster cast covers him from his chest to his knees. A father and son sit alone in a side room. They are the only two of their family left alive. I ask the father what brought them here. An Israeli missile hit their car as they fled their battered town vaporizing his wife. His teenage daughter was decapitated in the blast. He had to carry her all the way to the hospital, headless in his arms. These stories changed minds. The difference between coming home from Gaza in 2014 and coming home in 2002 could not have been more stark. When people have the opportunity to hear the real stories in their true context, they make better decisions. So I wanted to build a bigger platform so we could reach more people in this way. In October 2015, I co-founded The Canary. We set up with less than 500 pounds, no external investment, no network, no powerful friends, just a bunch of writers with a dream. Within months, The Canary broke into the UK's top 100 news sites. And by the 2017 general election, more people were reading The Canary Online, The New Statesman, The Spectator, Reuters, and The Times. <laughs> Veteran publications with power, money, and influence. We have now reached over 21 million readers. That's a conversation big enough to change the world, or at least a bit of it. In fact, just an impromptu moment, can I just get the canaries that are in the room to stand up, please? I really want you to see the people that write your news. Come on, canaries. (laughs) 
every day we get to tell the unreported, underreported and misreported stories the world needs to hear. And our newsroom is made up of all the people that fall outside the confines of the mainstream press. We look and sound as diverse in every way as Britain and the world in which she sits. And we are far from alone. A fleet of new media outlets are doing this same work day in and day out. Squawk Box, Media Diversified, The Ferret, Unity News, The Bristol Cable, and countless others are reaching people with the kinds of stories told in the kinds of ways that we rarely, if ever, see in the establishment media. I don't look or sound like the editor-in-chief of a leading media outlet. I'm a black, gay, working-class girl from Kingswood, Bristol, who dropped out of university in her second year. But luck and curiosity have granted me this series of life experiences which gave me both the audacity and sheer bloody-mindedness to pursue this dream. My parents, my grandparents, my teachers, my friends, and women like Claudia Jones have been the inspiration and signposts along the way. Every day now at the Canary, we are telling the untold and mistold stories that will change the world. And in a human voice that anyone with a reading age of eight can understand, because stories are everything. For each of us to be a part of building a world that works for everyone, we have to know what doesn't work what needs to change, and feel empowered to change it. I don't do what I do because I believe humanity is doomed and people are wretched. I do what I do because I believe people are infinitely capable of good, of evil, and of everything in between. We are empowered or limited by our stories about ourselves and each other, and we can quite literally become the authors of our own story. We can choose what is written on the page of our human history. Today, our world feels like a very scary place to live. Ideological austerity is asset stripping our welfare state. Sick and disabled people are being harassed, in some cases to death, by a soulless government. All around the world, people are being mutilated and murdered in wars that have the chief aim of creating new markets for Western corporations. And a resurgent far right is on the march across Europe, the US and around the world. Many of us are looking around us and over our shoulders asking, where's the cavalry that's going to come and sort all of this out? But the cavalry isn't coming because we're it. We are the cavalry. This is our time and our world to shape. The suffragettes risked life and limb to gain women the vote. Rosa Parks refused to sit at the back of the bus to empower black people to gain equal rights. Martin Luther King gave his life to empower America to embrace itself in all its diversity. And Claudia Jones dedicated her life to building a world that works for everyone. <coughs> the Occupy movement empowered millions of people across the globe to continue that work. Throughout history and today, individuals and groups of people have committed themselves to the valiant and awe-inspiring endeavor of building a world that works for everyone. A world where race, religion, class, sexuality, gender identity, or any other arbitrary distinction between you and me ceases to define us. Each of our efforts is a tiny drop, but together they form a tsunami, an unstoppable wave of social progress towards that world. How do we build a world that works for everyone? We write our own story in which we have the audacity 
to dream big and the sheer bloody mindedness to settle for nothing less. Before I leave this stage tonight, I want to finish with a simple message. You might be sitting there in your seat or watching this on a television, a phone or a computer anywhere in the world. And you might be thinking, I don't have the power to change the world. Let me tell you this. You may doubt your own power, but the establishment does not. They are terrified that you will realize what's possible when each of us brings our unique power to this task. If you doubt that, just look how hard they worked to stop Claudia Jones, one working class black woman, from telling her story in the 20th century. And how here in the 21st century, the media political establishment of Britain tried so hard to stop me, one black working class woman from telling you this story tonight. Thank you.